And welcome to the History of Sacadvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 29, The Holy and Right Believing. In today's episode, we are going to bring Vakhtar Gorgasali's story to a close. And, as always, a warning that we do not have much information on Vakhtang, so we are relying heavily on the Chronicles. As is always the case in history, everything is filtered through the biases, prejudices, and unique perspectives of the people who wrote things down. The Georgian Chronicles were not only written centuries after the events they described took place, but were created at the behest of the rulers of the Bagrationi dynasty. The information presented here will reflect the particular religious, social, economic, and political context in which they existed. In our last episode, we saw King Vakhtan head off to war against the lands of India and Sindhya alongside the Sassanid Shah. But of course, this story has a dubious origin and we can't corroborate it at all. However, it is a fun one and is contained in a mythos of Vakhtan Gorgasali, so it is worth retelling. Eight long years had passed since Vakhtang had last set foot in his homeland of Kartli. Eight long years since he had seen his family. Eight long years he spent fighting battles in unknown lands against unknown enemies, weeping over the loss of his trusted men, and, in the words of the Sindian king, thinking about being the crow that cared for the wounded hawk. Fanfare erupted as the Sassanid army entered the city of Edessa, with Shah Peroz at its head. Vakhtang entered later with his own entourage, and they made their way to the palace. He was approached by his mother and sister, who had remained in Edessa awaiting his return eagerly. Once the greetings were over, and King Vakhtang had spent a few days with his family, Shah Peroz called for his comrade to join him in a private meeting. When Vakhtang arrived, the Shah was grinning ear to ear. He embraced him and kissed him on each cheek. Vakhtang had not remarried since the death of his beloved years earlier, and the King of Kings thought it was time for that to change. It was not enough for the King of the Kart Valley to be his brother-in-arms. They must become brothers-in-law as well. Kind of weird that he said so because they were already brothers-in-law after the Shah married Vakhtang's sister, but whatever. The King of Kartli took his time to ruminate over his suzerain's offer. On one hand, he had the Byzantine Emperor offering him the hand of his daughter, the Princess Helena. Vakhtang was, of course, devoutly Christian, and there is never a downside to having the might of the Roman Empire on your side. On the other hand, the Shah, in whose palace he currently resided, offered him one of his own relatives. The Shah might be offended if his guest turned down such a generous offer. In a world where the marriage of one man decides the fate of all his people, and perhaps even all the nations of the world, this decision was not to be taken lightly. Vakhtang's next words would seal the fate of the Kartveli. He told the Shah, quote, It is improper for me to have two wives, for I already have the great Caesar's daughter as my spouse. End quote. With that, the brothers in arms were not so brotherly anymore. The Shah would be a powerful ally to be sure, but not one he was certain he could trust. For the crow of Kartli to tend the wounds of the Persian hawk would be to invite disaster. Furthermore, Vakhtang was a Christian. He could no longer ally himself with the fire worshippers he had disdained for so long. Shah Peroz's smile turned to a frown, and the warmth of the air was replaced with an icy chill. Peroz did not speak a word. Vakhtang thanked the Shah for his offer and returned home to Mitasheta alongside his mother and older sister. On the road to Mitasheta, Vakhtang sent an envoy to Byzantium requesting the priest Peter and the monk Samuel, whom he had met on the battlefield, as well as the beautiful Princess Helena, daughter of Emperor Zeno, to be his bride. However, the bliss of holy matrimony would unfortunately not happen in a time of peace. 
There is something rotten in the state of Mitoshieta. Sectarianism between the Heret, um, I mean the Monophysites and the Diophysites. To be brief, a Monophysite is a Heret, uh, sorry, I mean a Monophysite is someone who believes that Jesus Christ only had one will, not two wills. In other words, while many Christians believe Jesus was both human and divine, the Monophysites believe this was impossible and that his nature was completely divine. There are several other key differences in this, but that explanation is the easiest one because it's in the name. A Diophysite is the belief that Jesus Christ had two wills and it is the currently recognized doctrine. After spending so much energy battling fire worshippers, you would think the Christian leadership would be less divided. Freud got a lot of things wrong, but he was completely right about the narcissism of small differences. Anyhow, these intense religious debates erupted with the news from the West that one of the Hosroid princes, a man named Nabarnugios, had taken the cloth and become known as a monk named Peter the Iberian. His teachings on monophysitism had spread throughout the East and had caused a whole slew of issues for the local populace, and that included Cartley. You can check out Peter the Iberian's episode on Patreon. Monophysitism spread as far as the center of religious faith in Svetitz Haveli Cathedral to Bishop Mikkel, who Vaktang had placed in power all those years ago. The bishop had received word from the messengers that Vaktang had asked for several more bishops to come to Kartli, and got it into his mind that King Vaktang was trying to replace him with someone of more diophysite leanings. Upon entering Kartli, Vaktang's entourage w was approached by a young man followed by a slew of armed guards. Vaktang smiled and embraced the greatest gift of his dearly departed wife, his son, Dachi. Prince Dachi proceeded to ask his father about his adventures and noble deeds over the last eight years in the Indian and Sindian territory, while the crowd grew to include nobles and bishops they passed by. That filthy heret, mm, I mean, Bishop Mikkel, only grew angrier as messengers brought more and more news of the king's arrival with an entourage of diophysites. He sent a messenger of his own, saying, Quote, it seems you have renounced Christ and have begun to place your trust in fire, end quote. Alluding to Vaktang's travels and close travels with the Persian Shah over the last eight years. This would simply not do for the king, as he sent a message back to Bishop Mikkel, stating, quote, By the power of Christ I entered this country, and by the right of Christ's power I left it. And God knows, I feel no guilt but I sent the envoy to bring here the Catholicos and the bishops. End quote. This response left Bishop Mikhail quiet, so he schemed in private to find a way to denounce Vaktang. The delicate piece of Kartli was beginning to unravel over the fervor of the controversy, and Mikhail, being one of the most powerful people in the church, had the most to lose. One Sabbath, the bishop cursed King Vaktang and his whole army from the pulpit. He cried that he and all his men would be damned to hell for their heresy and were unfit to rule. The congregation merely stood there confused, as Vaktang's well-earned reputation was one of piety and willingness to go to war and die for Christ. Suddenly, the doors of the entrance swung open and all turned to gaze on the radiant king of Kartli. He dismounted, crossed himself three times, kissed the icon on the altar, and swaggered up to Bishop Mikkel. The bishop was seeing red, but the pious Vaktang prostrated himself before the bishop to kiss at his feet. The furious bishop responded to this gesture by kicking his king in the face. The king fell backwards, spat out a bloody tooth, and said to him, quote, This impudence and pride of yours are the machinations of the devil. If the abundance of my sins made you so indignant, you still have no right to be so angry. You must absolve them, like the gospel teaches. Do not extinguish a sensitive lamp, and do not stamp on a trampled reed. But you think that with the help of your machinations you will stop our love for Christ, and your perfidy becomes particularly obvious when you learned that a man has been brought to Cartley who will be charged to supervise you and a malicious envy seized you, of the kind that Judas felt for Peter. For you are like Judas, and the church is like Peter. 
You are a money grubber and the Christ's treasurer. Now I am sending you to the patriarch in Constantinople and let him judge what you deserve. End quote. The bishop was soon on the next cart to the Byzantine capital, surrounded by several envoys and armed guards that carried evidence of his treachery in the form of the king's missing tooth. They also carried a message requesting 12 new bishops and a catholicos. Bishop Mikhail was tried before the patriarch as the envoys recounted the tale of Bishop Mikhail's treachery against the king. He was charged with and found guilty of using the church as a ground for spreading false words and financial gain, and for shedding the blood of a person. A priest is never allowed to shed the blood of another, not even in anger. The patriarch stripped Mikhail of his bishopric and priestly cloth, and forced him to live the rest of his life at a monastery. With the former bishop of Cartley now dealt with, the patriarch called for the priest Peter and the monk Samuel to appear before him in Constantinople, and upon their arrival, told them Vachtang requested their presence by name. Peter was ordained a Catholicos, and Samuel became a bishop. The patriarch then mentioned that Vachtang had given them leave to choose the remaining eleven bishops that he had asked for. More and more, it appeared that Vachtang's vision in Anatolia was coming true. The other message was sent to the emperor, requesting the hand of his daughter, Helena, in marriage. He happily presented her to the newly ordained Catholicos of Cartley, and sent her off with numerous fine wedding gifts and a legion of Byzantine soldiers to ensure their safe passage as far as the borders of Armenia. Once there, Vaktang met his betrothed for the first time, and greeted Peter and Samuel as if no time had passed between them. Peter wasted no time getting to work as a Catholicos of Mitzchieta, setting up shop in the Svetitskaveli Cathedral. Bishop Samuel established himself in Mitzchieta under Peter. With his powers Catholicos, Peter staffed all the churches of Cartley, especially at the Church of Nicosi, which was a Zoroastrian fire temple converted to a church that also housed the relics of the Saint Rajdan, the proto-martyr. Small digression here. Saint Rajdin was the tutor of Vaktang's first wife, Balandukt, when she was converting to Christianity early in the marriage. Rajdin was captured by the Persians during one of their invasions against Vaktang and was tortured to death for refusing to renounce Christ. Digression over. With the heret- I, I mean, Monophysites taken care of with Mikkel's dismissal, Cartley became staunchly Diophysite, and there was a great period of peace. Vaktang's marriage to Helena produced three sons and two daughters, ensuring that Vaktang had plenty of heirs to the throne and marriages of alliances to do. However, not all things were well in Mitesieta. It became more and more of a religious capital, and with that comes clashes between the church and state. The elites of the church and nobility argued more and more, inducing headaches in a battle-hardened king. He just wanted to get away from it all, and, as he got older, he thought more and more of relocating his capital. But, where would he go that would benefit him and wouldn't be a religious hub already? He quite enjoyed living at his palace in Ujarma, as it gave him many areas to hunt and had many good hills to graze sheep and grow food. But, it was still a palace where he would have to put up with these conflicts, as it was technically under the purview of his son and associated priestly entourage. Plus, as we all know, nothing bad ever happens to kings during hunting trips. To clear his mind, Vaktang decided to go hunting with his favorite falcon. It soon spotted a pheasant and led the king and his men on a chase. The flighty forest fowl fled from the fierce falcon, disappearing behind a hill with his pursuer in tow. When Vaktang crested the hill, he stumbled on a most peculiar sight. Both the birds floated in a mysterious pit of bubbling water, boiled to death. This was no ordinary body of water, but a hot spring. Further investigation revealed that the countryside was littered with them. He decided that it would be a great place to build a city, and decided to call it by a rather creative name. In English, it's Warm Location. However, in the Georgian language, Tipili. Far into the future, the city would be known as Tbilisi. There we go. And another small digression. We've heard Tbilisi mentioned a few times in the Chronicles, and it's more than likely people were already living there. 
but it probably wasn't a place of major note, only housing a small village at the time, and maybe a fortress. Under Voktang's reign, Tbilisi would begin its conversion from a small village to a functioning capital, but Voktang would not live to see the completion of this project. With a new capital under construction, Voktang set out to ensure that his power would remain stable throughout the region. With more territory under his belt and a chance to do something with it, Voktang set out to place nine dukes in charge of his new territory acquisitions, including parts of Svanetia and Inner Igrisi. Abkhazia is not mentioned in this list since Lazika was still under Byzantine control after Voktang's negotiations with the Byzantines way long ago in a previous episode. Overall, things were pretty peaceful and courtly, but the rest of the world was not so nice. Turmoil erupted in Persia with the death of Shah Peroz thanks to a classic succession crisis, which eventually ended with the ascent of Kavad I to the throne of the Persian Empire. Stability for the Persians, however, was a threat to the Kartveli. The hawk had healed, and it was a good time for it to eat the crow. Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Well... Good for the Persians, I mean. Shah Kavad requested Voktang's assistance in a war against Byzantium, just as Voktang had assisted Kavad's father, Shah Peroz, all those years ago. The Byzantines under Emperor Anastasius I refused to send tribute any longer, and what they would not pay in gold, they would pay in blood. Kavad wanted Voktang to lead the Persian invasion force as well as marry Voktang's oldest daughter. By this time, Voktang was in his 60s, and wanted to spend his twilight years building his new capital, not off fighting wars. Voktang could only sigh and think about his options. Like all those years ago, when faced with either marrying a Byzantine princess or Sassanid noblewoman, he had chosen Byzantium. Now, the Persians come to him once more and ask him to make a decision, except this one would lead to war with either empire. Voktang simply responded, quote, Say to King Kavad that he should prepare first for the war with us, and only after that invade Greece. For any force is based on the power of the cross. And henceforward, our life is in setting hopes on he who was crucified. End quote. In spite of this questionable musing on military strategy, Vatang made his decision clear. The envoy turned a ghostly pale and respectfully said his goodbyes. Moments later, Voktang sent a message out to his nobles. The Persians give us no choice, and we must trade in our peacetime bickering and unite against the Sassanid Empire. Evacuate all civilians either to the mountains or let them seek shelter behind fortifications, for if you can stand against the might of an empire, let alone a comparatively small kingdom such as Kartli. He cracked down on the Persian colluders in his own court and executed a man by the name of Varskin for espionage and the murder of his Christian wife, Shushanik, through torture and multiple beatings. This is also a Patreon episode. Dachi, heir to the throne, retreated to the safety of the Lapoti Valley in the very likely case that his elderly father would fall in battle. Vakhtang concurred, as the death of Dachi under any circumstance would surely trigger a succession crisis. Helena and the rest of his family retreated behind the sturdy walls of Ujarma. At the fortress of Ardamazi, Vaktang was flanked by his longtime friends and advisors, the Suspeto Juan Sher and Adarnase. At the fortress of Mitesheta, right across the river, Dimitri, Nasra, and Bivritian, the other comrades of Vaktang, stationed themselves and their forces. Vaktang sent an envoy to the Byzantines to warn them of the upcoming Sassanid threat and that the Kartveli would hold off the large force as much as they could until they could receive reinforcements. The sound of Persian footsteps echoed throughout the countryside. The citizens of Kartli were not mandated to evacuate, and so the screams of innocence, then silence, announced to all that the Sassanids were coming. The Persian forces eventually set up camp on the banks of the Yori River. Vaktang's forces emerged from the safety of their fortresses and clashed for three days. Although each battle was inconclusive and casualties were great for both sides, each one was far more costly for Vaktang than for Kavad. He turned to the Catholicos Peter for support. Vaktang saw the writing on the wall and knew this had turned from a battle for control over Kartli 
to a last-ditch effort to avoid the total subjugation of the Kartvelian people. If need be, he, King Vakhtang Gorgasali, would give his life in battle to protect the Christian faith in Georgia. Peter nodded knowingly and recalled their first meeting. Everything that had been foretold had come true but one thing. Vakhtang would not die in peace. He would die in battle protecting the Christian faith. Vakhtang ordered Peter's retreat to the Church of Nikolsi near Jarma and headed off to meet his men and perhaps his maker. Vakhtang divided his forces into three. The infantry would hide behind the rocks that surrounded the Yori River, Zhuan Sher would flank the Persian force, and Vakhtang would charge straight into the Persian camp. Zhuan Sher had his concerns about his now elderly friend fighting in battle himself, but Vakhtang would not have any dissent. He needed to be in the field to ensure that the Persians continued to fear the wolf's head. At early dawn, the morning mist burned off and revealed the path to the Persian camp. Vakhtang charged. They shattered the wooden gates and stormed through the camp, killing as many Persians as possible. Vakhtang himself, a giant on horseback, rode straight into Kavad's section of the camp, sword in hand. However, the noise of the destruction of the gates alerted Kavad, who was now fleeing on horseback himself. Vakhtang charged after the Persian Shah, attempting to end the Persian invasion in a single blow, but was stopped by Bartam, Kavad's own son. Bartam lunged at Vakhtang's horse with his spear, but he managed to evade. Something about this princeling made it seem that unless he was taken care of, all would be lost. Vakhtang abandoned his chase and doubled back towards Bartam, his blade outstretched. Bartam's eyes widened as Vakhtang approached him at full gallop, and his eyes remained wide forevermore as Vakhtang lopped his head off with a single blow. He circled back again and resumed his pursuit of the King of Kings, who fled in fear of Vakhtang's wolf's head. This would be his chance to save Christendom and bring the fire worshippers to their knees. The horse whinnied, and Vakhtang felt himself fall forward as if something pushed him from behind, but he continued riding. He didn't have time to worry about an accidental hit from behind. As he came closer and closer to Shah Kavad, Vakhtang Gorgasali found it harder and harder to catch his next breath. His vision became blurred, and he lost sight of Kavad. In the middle of battle, Vakhtang stopped and looked around the field. Persians and Kartveli were slaughtering each other, and as he moved, he winced. More and more, as his nerves flared from his back and lungs, shooting the word pain into his mind. Then, one more word entered his head. Air. An arrow had pierced his lungs. Vakhtang fell off his horse. The ground around him was littered with the corpses of Persians, but very few of the Kartveli. Spaspeto Juanchert arrived, found the king, and took him back to the palace at Ujarma. His men located the offending arrow and broke off the shaft, leaving only the arrowhead. Vakhtang awoke in his palace, still struggling for breath. Spaspeto Juanchert informed him that Karvad had escaped and made a camp in Rustavi, but that he, King Vakhtang Gorgasali, was dying from a pierced lung. Vakhtang nodded saving his energy for when he needed it most. The Persians learned that Vakhtang Gorgasali, the ever-famous wolf's head, had finally been injured in battle, and they found themselves reinvigorated. The long and feared Vakhtang Gorgasali had finally been put in his place, and could no longer fight against the Persians. Around the same time, the reinforcements that Vakhtang had asked for had made their way to the Sassanid border, but retreated when the news of Ostrogothic incursions into Byzantium occurred, leaving the Kartveli with no one to assist them. Each breath was a struggle for the Kartveli king, and he called for Dachi to join him. He entrusted Dachi fully with the Kartveli throne, and with so, gave him these final words. Quote, and I, as I go to my god... I give thanks to his name, because he did not spare his chosen saints. 
Now I exhort you that you stand firm in your faith and seek death for Christ in his name so that you may obtain imperishable glory. I have magnified you all. I have magnified you and all my generations in the flesh with glory. Neither disgrace our home nor abandon the love of the Greeks. You, the original residents of Cartley, remember my good deeds, for you were favoured with eternal baptism in my house. And I, through the embodied greatness of mine, have glorified you as among my kin. Do not hold my house in contempt, and do not give up your love to the Greeks. Me hort celebrita didebita gadident quen nates autacent. Da saxa chensan sheurats hot. Da siqarul sa berzenta sa no daudeot. Me serats arwalt ina sheurti sa chemis da madlob sahel sa mis ramet huara damaklo kamorche utats mina tamista. At gams nept quen ratam kitet sarts unoeb sa zedast ket. Da edziab det Christes tu siqul sa sahel sa mis sa zeda. End quote. With the crown on Dachi's head, Vaktang passed into the heavenly world and was buried at the Svetitz Chaveli Cathedral in Mitesieta, beneath the pillar housing the tunic of Christ. The people of Kartli mourned intensely for their king and looked forward to seeing what Dachi would do in the face of the Persian threat. Vaktang, however, would go through the annals of history and become known as the holy and right believing Saint King Vaktang Gorgasali. First of all, many thanks to Robin Pearson of the History of Byzantium for reading Vaktang's English quotes and for Zviad Lazishvili for reading the quotes in Georgian. To connect with us, feel free to find us on social media under at History Georgia or on Facebook at the History of Sagardvelo Georgia. We are currently migrating the website to a new host, so it is down in the meantime. To help this podcast continue, please feel free to subscribe to our Patreon or donate via Coffee or PayPal. The link is in the episode description. If you would prefer donating something a bit more tangible, we also have an Amazon wish list for you to peruse. However, the best way to help us is via a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast host, as it goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about Georgia. Madlaba da Nakvamdis, and thank you for listening to the history of Sakadvelo, Georgia. See you next time. <laughs> Ne vadim